and Brad, we uh, talked a lot about sin, and we should because this is the festival that deals with that particular uh, problem. And uh, we deal with uh, sin being removed from our lives because the leavening we put out of our homes, and I hope you've already done that, pictures and portrays the uh, sin that we're ordered to put out of our lives. It's significant, I feel, that uh, leaven, though it pictures uh, all of uh, sin and every sin that we commit in a general way, actually has a specific application to one sin in particular. And I want to talk about that one particular sin this morning because it's a sin that all of us have, and all of us are guilty of it, and some of you are being overwhelmed by it. Now, leaven, uh, you know, causes dough to puff up and to expand and to uh, sort of inflate, and I think all of you realize that. And there's a particular sin I want to talk about this morning that causes the human mind or a demon mind, because a demon can be affected by this, or even an angelic mind, to puff up, to expand, and to sort of inflate. And uh, it really causes a lot of problems when that begins to occur. But I submit to you that this particular sin has wreaked greater havoc in the plan of God than any other sin. I wonder if you know what it is. I submit to all of you that this particular problem has fomented more violence. It has caused... Uh, more uh, wretched uh, problems uh, in the universe that God has created than any other specific sin has ever caused. It is the oldest sin, not necessarily in your life, though it possibly is. It is the greatest sin. There's a scripture in the book of Psalms that says that that sin will cause you to sin the great sin. What is the great sin? It is the most pervasive of all sins, and brethren, it is the sin in particular that you've got to overcome, and if you do not overcome it, you cannot be in the kingdom of God, no matter what your attitude is. A good attitude is fine, but you've got to do a certain amount of overcoming, and there is a sin in particular that must be dealt with, otherwise it would be dangerous, it would be the height of folly to allow you into the kingdom of God unless that sin is basically gone from your life. I want you to understand that I'm talking about the sin that got Lucifer literally heaved out of the heavens millions of years ago. You know what that sin was? It's the sin that got Adam and Eve booted out of the garden 6,000 years back. And it led, unfortunately, dozens of our ministers and scores of our baptized members out of the Church of God if you short five, six, seven years ago. And it may occur again because it comes back on a pretty regular basis. It reoccurs, and Satan broadcasts this particular attitude into our mind. And uh, we think we've resolved it, and we assume it's gone, and there it is again. Well, I've analyzed the attitude and the reactions and the outlook of dozens of our ministers and other people, of course, who have exited from the Church of God for various and sundry reasons. And, you know, there is an amazing sameness about a lot of the stories that are told when people attempt to justify and to rationalize their leaving the Church of God, and everybody always does. Nobody goes out and says, well, I'm leaving because I'm sort of weak, and I wish I wasn't, but uh, I am, and, uh, you know, that's sadly the way it is. So uh, I guess I'm just going to have to, uh, you know, admit the fact that I have a problem. People never do that. They justify. And you listen to the stories, and somehow, someplace, you know, hidden in all of the uh, war stories and the complaints and the uh, disloyal comments, and there are always a lot of those, and the massive amount of self-justification, because there's a great deal of that. Uh, somehow, I don't know, I'm a little bothered. Maybe some of the elders and deacons can help me. There just seems to be an awful lot of people walking around. And I really, I can't concentrate when I speak, when there's a lot of motion going on at the back of the hall. I don't mind a few people going out to the bathroom, but it just seems to be too much activity. And uh, it, it makes me wonder, is somebody sick? <laughs> is somebody dying? Or uh, what's happening? And I get very uptight, and I simply cannot concentrate in my sermon. I notice several people running across the lawn out there and out in the parking lot. And maybe uh, you could just ask those that seem to be uninvolved in the service, uh, to, uh, you know, I think we have enough people checking on it now because now we're getting people, so many people checking on it, it's amplifying the problem. <laughs> There's just maybe two or three people. But uh, that's the way I'm, I am. I, I don't, I get edgy if a lot of people are, you know, moving around in waves in the congregation during the service. And I'd rather you be sitting and listening to the sermon 
rather than checking something out across the way or having a look at the parking lot or something of the kind. Uh, it really does spook me. Anyway, I'm sorry about that, but uh, you just have to live with my weaknesses. Uh, you deal with these war stories, and there are many of those. And you find hidden, you know, uh, in the complaints, you dig down, you try to find the, uh, the core of it all. And ultimately, when you do this, when you analyze those who have left, you do find a kind of a core. You find a, a hardball, a mass of arrogant, rebellious, untamed pride. You find pride. And some of you think, oh, no, I, I have no problem with that. I'll tell you, brethren, you do. There's not a person in the hall that does not. You find pride that has been nurtured and inspired by the spirit of Satan because that is the basic source and that has not been worked upon by the miraculous working of the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit of God will take that ball of pride that you and I have had built within us by Satan and the working of Satan's spirit. And the Spirit of God will begin to break it up and destroy it and remove it completely and it will be gone. But the Spirit of God does that. Now, this is not a kind of a peripheral issue. Uh, there's not a person here that doesn't have some kind of a problem. You know why some wives have a hard time submitting to their husband? You know why? Because you want to be the boss. What does that tell you about yourself? You want to be the boss. Why do you want to be the boss? Because you feel you're as good as the boss? Because you feel you're better than the boss? That's a pride problem. If you have to sort of, you know, uh, grit your teeth and say, well, I will submit to him if I must, you're proud. God talks about proud women, what will happen to them someday in the tribulation. You know why teenage kids get sort of aggressive and assertive at a certain time in their life? You know what does that? You know where it comes from? You know what Satan broadcasts into our mind from the day that we are born? Because, you see, he is a proud spirit. Satan is a proud spirit. He is the father of pride. The first sin was pride. And Satan wants us to sin the sins that he has sinned. So from the day a little baby is born, he builds pride into their minds. And it reaches a certain pinnacle, a certain point, generally in the middle teens. And it's sort of interesting, isn't it? What happens to these humble, sweet, teachable, wide-eyed little kids? They get to be 15, 16, 17, and 18. And what begins to occur? What do you see in their eyes? Well, you see assertion, you see independence, those are normal things. You also begin to see rebellion, you begin to see insolence, you begin to see certain other things. And when that begins to occur, what do you have? What is happening? You know, I could talk about a lot of people. I'll mention a few indirectly today. I think I should. There is a problem that some of us have. And it comes because the main element, the principal carnal reaction that Satan broadcasts into our mind the day that we are born to lead us away from the rule of God and the kingdom of God and the family of God is pride. And the larger and the more massive and the more inflated that inner core of pride becomes, the harder it is to obey God. It really is. The harder it is to obey anybody, your parents, you know, a deacon that says, sit over here, and you say, I'm not going to sit over there. We had a deacon in San Bernardino a couple of years back who went and sat in the middle of the section which said reserved. Now, it was reserved because the hall was way too large for the congregation, and the congregation needed to be grouped, and we cordoned off a part of the building, and nobody sat there. One Sabbath, he stepped over the cordon over the ropes, with his wife and his kids, and he sat in the middle of the cordon off section. And one of the elders went up to him and said, Hey, you know, this section is cordon off, you can't sit here. And he said, Who tells me I can't sit here? And the elders said, Well, there's a sign. I mean, it's, it's, it's clear uh, oh, the brethren don't sit in this section. And he said, Well, I'm sitting here. And the elders said, Well, you can't. And the other man who was an ordained deacon said, Can we go back in the parking lot and discuss this? He meant, you know, with the fists. Well, he's gone. Pride always takes you. Pride always destroys you. It'll destroy every man, every woman, every child, every teen that doesn't somehow begin to deal with it in their lives and doesn't ask the living Jesus Christ to a specific food of the Spirit of God. 
to take it out of their lives. It must be removed. Now, the larger that mass of pride is, the harder it is to obey anybody. The harder it is to accept any kind of teaching, because pride makes you resentful towards authority. Pride uh, creates a kind of, re of a resistance. And when that resistance is there, well, you just, you know, you don't react, you don't respond to any kind of authority at all. It makes it very hard to acquire any kind of dependency upon God, because God says you must be dependent upon him, you see. That's a kind of a subservient position to God. And pride says, I will not be subservient to anybody. Pride says, in a woman, I will not be subservient to any man. I will not allow my life to be swallowed up and overshadowed by the life of a man, ever. Sad. I'll tell you about a man that said, I must diminish, and he must increase. Be nice if all women in the Church of God had that spirit. Pride makes it hard to deal with any sin of any type, because, you see, pride will get you so stuck in yourself and so full of self-importance that you begin to assume that any sin that you commit, you know, superstar that you are, uh, could never possibly be all that bad. Because you committed it, so how could it be all that bad? You see, it's your sin. And if you did it, it can't be that bad. In the last several years, I guess the last decade, about 10, 12 of our ministers in the USA have literally lost their wives. I mean, their wives simply took off, you know, dropped the kids, uh, packed their bags, hightailed it off to New York or Chicago or Dallas, to break into the big time, I do emphasize the big time, and, and to fulfill themselves, because that's in all the books, you see. You must fulfill yourself. If you're a woman, you must fulfill yourself. You've heard that. You've read that. How can you fulfill your life when you're home making meals, raising kids, uh, you, you know, and sort of subservient to the whims and the lifestyle of a man who's out on a job, and you've got to adapt to him? Now, hey, you can't fulfill yourself doing that. You may learn a lot of spiritual lessons. You may become a better human being. You may learn what meekness and submission and humility is all about. But maybe you won't fulfill your great dream of becoming a model or becoming a movie actress or becoming, you know, some great person. Well, anyway, about ten of them have taken off in the last decade. And you analyze the stories. And they all sound depressingly similar, the same scenario and the same, uh, the same mentality. Now, if you follow the, the stories on through to their basic core, uh, as I've tried to do, you find certain things that have occurred in all of these people's lives. And uh, you go back to the middle 70s and the liberal era, you find that most of the wives involved in leaving their husbands lately have, uh, you know, they began to get jobs and they began to work. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting a job. We do not say that it's a sin if a woman works. We do say it's something she ought to think about deeply. We do say she ought not do it if it means she is escaping from her husband's authority, and if that is her goal, it is wrong. If her goal is to make a little extra money because the family is going through a very hard period financially, that is all right. That certainly is okay. But this was not the circumstance involved in most of these cases. They left because to get the jobs because they wanted to escape the pressures of their husband's ministry, and there are a lot of pressures, you see, when you're a minister's wife. And, uh, you know, sometimes you do want to escape. There are times, brethren, when I would like to escape the pressure, not you, you see, not you, but the pressures that you create on occasion can become very hard to deal with. And uh, a woman who by nature tends to be more emotional to some degree than a man does can find the pressures and the emotional trauma of the ministry and sharing that with her husband very hard to cope with. And I understand that it's hard for a wife on occasion because she feels sort of submerged and overshadowed by her husband's ministry. And I've talked to scores of ministers' wives over the years who were not necessarily complaining, but were simply saying, you know, I, when I was in ambassador college, before I was married, I had an identity. I knew who I was. And I could do this and I could do that. And I knew that I was, you know, uh, I was me. And I've been married nine years now, and, and all I know is that I'm Mrs. So-and-so, I'm the minister's wife, and sometimes I, I sort of stand up or I, or I sit down and I wonder, am I still myself? Have I been sort of submerged by a man 
to the point that I don't know who I am any longer, except I do know I'm the handmaid of the eternal, but on beyond that I'm not quite sure. Of course, when they say that, I, I tend to tell them, well, look, that is your true identity, isn't it, after all? Isn't that the only lasting identity? You are the handmaid, which means the bond slave, the female bond slave of the eternal. And if the eternal, who is the master, says your life is going to have to be sort of overshadowed by that of a man for five, ten, or seventy-five years, isn't that what you ought to want, and isn't that the true you anyway? I mean, the true spiritual you. Well, I had women tell me, I, I, I feel swallowed up, my identity is being sort of lost by the pressures of people's problems because ministers tend to, you know, try to lean on their wife's uh, shoulder. They need someone to talk to. And wives become party to certain situations that develop. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes, oftentimes they are. The phone rings all the time, even when the husband isn't there. And there are activities that they're expected to attend, and they've got to be there. And uh, the pressures of having a husband whose uh, lifestyle is sort of erratic, and sometimes he's at home and sometimes he's not, and sometimes he eats at home and sometimes he doesn't. And you never really know when he's going to be there and when he won't be there. Most of the time he's late if he arrives at all. And, you know, a woman puts her life together in terms of meals and certain times and a structure and program. And sometimes the whole thing goes kaflui. And it is sort of hard. And I'll be frank with you, brethren. I, I tend to sympathize with ministers' wives. I feel sorry for them. I'm married to one, so I, you know, firsthand I know what it's like. I do feel sorry for them. And yet there is a red-letter scripture, is there not, that says, He that shall lose his life... Let's change it. She that shall lose her life, it means in sacrifice. And her life is sort of swallowed up in sacrifice. The scripture says she shall gain her life. God will give her life eternal. So is it all that bad to sort of feel a little swallowed up and diminished and sort of overshadowed? I don't think so. And what about the scripture that says, if you want to be my servant and follow me, you're going to have to take up a cross and bear it. You know what that means? It means sometimes you've got a burden on your back, and it'll always be there, and it'll never be removed. And you carry it with your back sort of bent. And you know, there are days when you say, boy, it would be nice not to have the cross, not to have the burden, because it would be easier. Uh, and, and you know... I'd like to break out of this situation and go get a snazzy job at the bank and wear pretty dresses and buy some new jewelry and be able to afford a, you know, a $40 uh, uh, two-hour session in the local hairstylists and, uh, you know, sort of strut around with all the other gals in the office and get a few compliments. And even though I'm 40 or 47 or, you know, even 52, have a man or two sort of look at me with that special look, and no, after all, I still am a woman. Yeah, I, I bet all of you have had those thoughts on rare occasion. I don't necessarily feel that those are wrong or unnatural or unusual thoughts, but they've got to be kept in control. Now, the Bible talks about priorities, and, you know, it says the sacrifice and putting up with things and, uh, you know, giving up are very high on God's list of priorities. And self-fulfillment and doing your own thing basically are very, very low. On occasion, you will be able to fulfill yourself, sure. God says that's fine. But that isn't high on his list of priorities. I'm, you know, I, I apologize to all of you uh, identity freaks who want to know who you are. I, I, I don't know that I can tell you. You know, some people uh, constantly look for the true self. They want to put themselves together. you got this talent, and they, they want so badly to, you know, spend their lives developing that particular talent. You find uh, sometimes people in the music field, and sometimes people in other fields, and they, this thing is in them. And, uh, you know, uh, they'll spend all of their life vainly trying to somehow, you know, make the big break, get into movies, get into this, get into that, make a record never comes, it never happens, but they're determined somehow, you see, to develop that particular talent. Maybe God wants them to work in a gas station. Maybe God wants to work, have them work in a bank, and uh, they don't want to do it. You know, Jesus Christ died 
on a stake. And you have to admit that dying isn't very fulfilling. Did Jesus Christ fulfill his total potential? And all the books talk about fulfilling your potential nowadays. Did Jesus Christ fulfill his potential? Do you read about that? Was it fulfilling? Was it exciting? Was it, you know, uh, motivational to hang on that stake for hours and hours and hours with the flies buzzing around him by the hundreds and the spittle sort of dribbling down his face and, 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 and the filth and the dirt because he was, you see, sort of dragged through the dirt after he was whipped causing those wounds to become infected. Was that fulfilling? Was that fun? Was he really enjoying himself? Is that what life is all about? You know, it was necessary that Jesus Christ die. It was necessary. And sometimes it's necessary that you give up. Sometimes it's necessary, you see, that you humble yourself before the living God. Sometimes it's necessary to be broken-spirited. Sometimes it is necessary to learn what meekness is all about. And those are some of the most painful things that can happen in your entire life. Nobody wants to be meek by nature. You don't want to be meek. You'll run from that. You don't want to be humble. You'll run from that. Don't tell me that you're humble by nature. Nobody is. By nature we are proud. Because that is what Satan broadcasts into our minds from the day that we are born. You finally come to the point in life when you've got to be able to say to God, Father, I may not be front and center right now. In fact, I may never be front and center again. You know, I may never be front and center again. If I have to accept second choice or second best or third choice or third best for a year or for five years or for 55 years, if that is what you want and if that is, this is where you want me and this is how you want things to happen, then that's the way it's going to be because I'm your bond slave. I am your handmaid. You know what, what happened when the angel came to Mary and said, Mary, you are pregnant of the Holy Spirit, and she didn't have a husband. They were just betrothed. And the angel said, there is a baby growing in your body. And she wasn't living with a man. And she knew what the neighbors would think as she began to get larger for three months. You see, she got bigger and bigger. Joseph didn't live with her then. You know what it was like? Can you imagine in the very traditional type of society to be told by an invisible spirit being, you are with child of the Holy Spirit? Did Mary begin to think, hey, wait a minute. I got a future ahead of me. I got a man who loves me and wants to marry me, and when he sees I'm pregnant, that's the end of that. I have a reputation. I, uh, I have a good reputation. I've been clean all of my life, and when the neighbors see my stomach getting larger, that's the end of that reputation. Hey, wait a minute. I don't like this idea. You want to go back and read what Mary said when the angel explained to her what was going to happen? You know what she said? She said, so be it. I am the handmaid of the eternal. I'll tell you, ladies, some of you need to begin to view yourselves as the handmaid of the eternal. I know it's rough to be a wife. I'm sure it is. I mean, all of us would like to prance around in fancy clothes and nice, you know. I'd like to be able to go into a barber shop and tell the guy, look, Give me a ten-buck hairstyle. I got this old conservative 1955-ish haircut. Yeah, who likes that? I look like something out of a, you know, a, a 1950s comic book. You know what I do? You know, I sneak around to the old-fashioned barber shops where they'll still cut your hair for two dollars and seventy-five cents, because that's all I can afford. And there are times, you know. We're all people, aren't we? I, I'm a human being. I'd like to sort of go into one of these nice places, you know, the, the unisex places with all the men in there. No women, of course, but it says unisex. Uh, they would like the ladies to come in. A few of them come in, not too many. And, you know, sit back and let them wash it and, you know, do all the fancy things. I can't afford that kind of stuff, and uh, neither can some of you. Well, you know, there is a time to sort of realize that God doesn't necessarily exalt all of us quite as much as we would like, and there are reasons for that. There really are. Well, 
I, uh, I think we need to look at something in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, I think you'll see something about God and about the Spirit of God and the work of God and about sin that maybe you haven't necessarily looked at in quite the same way before. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You'll find the early Corinthian church was a very arrogant, ego-filled, self-important, self-centered, proud congregation. And sin was de-emphasized in Corinth. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of comparison going on. It was a very self-centered congregation, very filled with ego. And when you analyze it, you'll find a lot of reasons why. They were not humble. There was no spirit of sacrifice. There was no yielding spirit. Meekness was scorned and laughed at as weakness, and meekness is not weakness. Meekness is strength. Weakness is, uh, you know, uh, absolutely something totally different. First Corinthians chapter 5. You see that they were the church in their own eyes, when in actuality they were the weakest and the most carnal of all the congregations. You need to analyze why. And what about this type of unleavened bread? What does it picture? And what does leaven picture, really, in a, in a specific way, as far as specific sins are concerned? It's general, but it's also specific. Chapter 5, verse 1, it's, well, maybe back in chapter 4, because he begins to lead up into this. And he's talking about problems in Corinth and about difficulties in the congregation. These things, verse 6, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up. Notice the interesting analogy. He said there are people puffed up in the congregation, one against the other. He said it's like a bunch of peacocks all puffed up and sort of strutting around and getting in each other's way. And maybe you've noticed this at the, at the, at the zoo, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the section reserved for the birds. And they got a bunch of peacocks in there. And, you know, and all the males flounce up and puff up their tails at the same time, and they begin to, you know, walk into each other and knock each other over because they, there simply isn't any room uh, for, all the other, uh, for all the other peacocks. They're all puffed up, and people can get puffed up one against the other and uh, began to elevate themselves and say, I'm better than him, and began to make comparisons. That was happening in Corinth. It was an awful thing. And uh, going on down, verse 7, who makes you to differ from another? And what did you that you didn't receive? I mean, it's, it's come from God. Now, if you received it, why do you glory as if you hadn't received it? You know, as if you'd sort of uh, done all these things yourself, as if you, you, you're the source and all your talents have come because you're so great and you've developed them and, and, and God has nothing to do with it. Now, verse 8, you're full in your own eyes. Now you're rich. He said, you've reigned as kings without us. He's talking about their attitude. And I would to God you did reign, that we might also reign with you. For I think that God has set us the apostles last. And he goes on through here, talking about the haughty, uh, vain, pride-filled attitude of the brethren in Corinth. They had a lot of leaven in their life. And uh, verse uh, 17, For this cause will I send unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everyone in every church. Now some of you, he said, are puffed up, inflated in your own minds, as though I wouldn't come unto you. Yeah, Paul said he's coming. Ha! But you know Paul, he never comes when he says he's coming. People got very puffed up and supercilious and haughty and elevated in their own minds and began to look down on the apostle Paul. He said, I will come, verse 19, shortly, if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will you? Shall I come unto you with a rod, which you have the right to do, or in love, and notice, and in the spirit of meekness? Not the spirit of weakness, the spirit of meekness, which is something very special. Chapter 5. It's reported commonly that there's fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And the young man was living with his mother-in-law, that is, with his stepmother, and uh, the wife of uh, his father, but not his own physical mother. And verse 2 tells us the true problem. Why was it happening? Well, they, they, they were getting sort of uh, uh, desensitized towards sin. In Corinth, if you sinned, it wasn't all that bad because Corinth, you see, was number one. Corinth was numero uno as far as the churches back then were concerned. And you're all puffed up, he said, in your own mind. Puffed up. Now, that's the congregation. And the word is fusio in the Greek. And in the Greek vocabulary of the time, the word meant inflated and full of air and arrogant and filled with pride. 
And in fact, the English word pride, if you go back into the derivation of the English word pride, it goes back to this specific Greek word. Now, the word used pictured a bellows. You know what a bellows is? Uh, you use a bellows and you go like this to fill over there to get the fire going when the fire begins to go out. Uh, and, and the word related back to the air that was being uh, pumped out of the bellows to keep the fire going. And he said, your mind has been puffed up as if somebody had a bellows out there and was pumping this hot air into your brain. But the point that Paul doesn't mention here, but it is a truism, an axiom, and that is that Satan, in effect, does act as the custodian of a kind of a bellows. And the Bible says he pumps this air, this inflated, pride-filled attitude into our minds automatically. Now, we all need a kind of a balanced self-respect. I'm not talking about self-respect. Pride can be used in a positive way, and then perhaps we shouldn't even call it pride. It can refer to self-worth and a rightful kind of human dignity that makes you want to keep your yard clean and makes you want to keep your house looking sort of nice and makes you want to keep yourself and your body dressed properly, and that's the right kind of pride. I'd rather call it self-respect. Pride really is not meant to be used as a, as a positive term as far as Scripture is concerned. And God doesn't want us to be, you know, ugly, a repugnant, uh, spineless blob sort of lying there and quivering. He wants us to have a certain amount of self-respect, which is a good thing. But there's an extreme of pride that will so inflate you with self-importance and with ego and, uh, you know, with the need to satisfy yourself to the extent that you resent anybody pricking your balloon. You know, I don't give a lot of corrective sermons. I said to my wife, she said, boy, uh, your husband needs to take it easy on the churches he's in charge of. And my wife said, oh, oh, really? I mean, you know, the lady doesn't attend any of my congregations. She, she said, oh, yes. She said, my, uh, my relations tell me that he just beats on the people and, 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 and corrects them. Uh, and my relation says every service she leaves, she goes home with a splitting headache because, you know, he's just so oppressive. She said, you ought to tell your husband that really he ought to, you know, be a little nicer to the people. Well, my reaction is, well, I've been trying very hard, <laughs> I think, not to be all that corrective. You know, but it's interesting if you sort of stick a little pin into somebody's balloon, you see all this hot air in there is very, very sensitive. And when it begins to sort of, uh, you know, uh, exit via the hole that you stuck in it, uh, it does hurt. It hurts very, very badly sometimes. And I understand that. When you're puffed up, it hurts. Corrective sermons don't hurt all that much when you're not puffed up. Maybe you can measure yourself to some degree by that statement. Maybe you, you can take a certain uh, measuring. Uh, of where you stand. Uh, the puffed up mind resents any kind of authority, any kind of guidance, any kind of structure that isn't of its own making. It covets visibility usually, but it doesn't always do this. When you think of somebody who's proud, uh, you know, a lot of us tend to think of the, you know, the, the guy sort of strutting around, the peahen, the peacock, uh, the turkey, you know, all the strutters. Now the expression goes that you shouldn't raise peacocks and turkeys in the same yard because they're both strutters, and then you have problems. And people began to get that image in their mind. I found sometimes those who have the most pride are sort of quiet people who sometimes sort of sit off to the side and say, you know, we're just humble folks, but don't you dare tell us that we're not. Otherwise, you know, whoo! All this anger comes spilling out. You don't dare tell certain humble folks that they're not quite as humble as they think. They'll wring your neck if you do gets to be sort of a wild scene. Well, notice, chapter 2 says you're puffed up. You might think about that. He, talked to, he was talking to the congregation. You said you haven't. You, you should have mourned. You should have repented. You should have, you know, uh, broken down in tears and said to God, Father, we have really made a mess out of the church here in Corinth. But they hadn't had that spirit at all. For verily, verse 3, uh, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already. He was talking about the man. And he said he should be uh, placed outside of the body. And then in verse 6 he says this, Your glorying is not good. Notice, your glorying is not good. What does he mean by that? We'll get to that in a minute. Don't you know that a little leaven, uh, a little pride, he's talking specifically about pride, about sin in general, but about a specific sin. He said all of that puffing up, that's what leaven does. It puffs up. 
But he was talking, you see, about an attitude, an inflated attitude, a puffed up kind of a mindset. A little leaven will leaven the whole lump, purge it out, therefore. Well, it's a fact that that kind of problem has wrecked more ministers in the Church of God. I watched them become peacocks. I watched the humble little guys come to Ambassador College. It happens to everybody, me, you, doesn't matter who it is. And to take the classes with the childlike look in their faces and the love and the spirit of service, and you give them authority, and it goes to their head, and it begins to erect them. And it really hurts when you see it happen. I've seen it happen to deacons and members and elders and wives and teens. Then you watch the teens as they grow up in the Church of God. And around about 14, 15, or 16, you know, there is a time, and uh, who makes the decision, the parents or the kids themselves? There is a time when you look in their eyes and you think, what happened to their eyes? What happened? I've seen these beautiful kids, 11, 12, and 13, with a childlike spirit. And then, you know, in six months, it's gone. And there's all the hate and all the insolence and all the rebellion. And it's a frightening, scary thing. And all you can do is say to God, Father, you know, somehow work a miracle and take it out because they're going in the wrong direction. It wrecks Satan. I'll get to that in a minute. It wrecked Adam and Eve. You know, you know why the folks built the Tower of Babel? Would you build it if you were there? Yeah, they all did it. Most of them were involved. You know why they built the Tower of Babel? Question of vanity. So they could get way up on the 3,000th floor, you see, as high as they could get, and look down and say, look at those dummies down there. We build a building far higher than any building they've ever built, and we're closer to God because we're up here in the clouds. Self-elevation needs are very powerful in the human mind. We all want to be number one. And that ball of pride sort of grows. You know, it destroyed the best friend I had when I first went into it, came to Ambassador College and became a member of the Church of God. I met him the first day I arrived on the Ambassador College campus, and we hit it off almost immediately. It's hard to understand why sometimes you hit it off with people and you don't with others, but you know how friendships develop. And uh, I think I was unpacking my uh, suitcase in the dormitory, and he was there unpacking his, and we began to talk, and a friendship began. He was about my age, and I guess we hit it off because he liked to teach, and at that point in my life, I liked to be taught. I've sort of changed in some ways since then, but uh, I was new to the Church of God, and he was an old-timer. At least he indicated that to me. He'd been around a couple of years and that type of thing. So I liked to talk to him because he had answers, and I would pump him with all kinds of questions about the Church and about the Bible and about doctrine, and he always had the answers. So we would sit for hours and hours and hours and talk and talk and talk, and I, I didn't fully realize then that maybe there was a problem because he seemed to enjoy giving me answers, but he never seemed to enjoy asking questions. There's something to think about there. But I hadn't noticed that at the time. He never asked questions. He only gave answers. Anyway, we did a lot of things together in the first year of college, and uh, people called us the, the Bobsy twins for a while because we ate together and went to classes as much as possible together, shared a little money we had. And there's a time in your life when it's good to have close friends, and you share things, and that's a wonderful thing. We were good friends. But as the months went by, and I was growing in the truth of God and trying to get my perspective straight and put, put the spiritual picture of things together, I began to realize that he had a problem, and there were things that he did that began to embarrass me. I didn't even notice at the beginning, but I did notice finally after a certain number of months. There was this continual put-down of other people. At the beginning, I thought he was sort of funny. The way he would sort of, you know, put other people down. I know now that those who are experts in put-downs are experts in put-downs because they're attempting to elevate themselves. When you put other people down, you see, you're, at, you're automatically putting yourself a little higher than them. It's a form of self-elevation. I didn't fully realize that. I guess I laughed at the beginning when he would say certain things about other students, about the way they looked or the way they acted. I wasn't amused by the fact that he often called Mr. Armstrong the old man. Now, that was 25 years ago. Mr. Armstrong was about 64 years of age at the time. He was not an old man then. Uh, I guess now he is a, a gentleman of, of mature age. But I was sort of bothered by the fact that he would call Mr. Armstrong the old man. I remember one day I, I mentioned to this to my friend that, you know, it was amazing how impressive Mr. Armstrong looked because he had snow white hair 
and his wife had snow white hair. And uh, he said, yeah, he said, I bet they touch it up to, you know, look holy. Uh, I was bothered by that because, of course, they don't touch it up to look holy. I mean, Mrs. Armstrong's hair was pure white, and Mr. Armstrong's hair was pure white. And they were a very impressive-looking couple, uh, and nothing to do with, with a dye job. But he, he would make innuendos like that. I noticed how he often poked fun at student body leaders. And that sort of bothered me, and yet I thought, well, he's my friend, and, you know, uh, I wasn't spiritually sensitive to things like that at the time. I caught him smoking one day in a prayer closet. And he said, well, he said, I don't do it very often, just every now and then. I was sort of upset because he was my friend, and I didn't know that he smoked. I didn't know he was doing it on the sly, and I was bothered by that. Then there was a day when he uh, took a Coke out of the Coke machine. And that wouldn't have been so bad, except there was a sign above the Coke machine on the campus that said, Restricted to the use of campus gardeners. It wasn't for the student body, it was for the gardeners. And he went over to the machine and took a Coke out and opened it up and he began to drink it. And I said to him, I said, hey, you know, it, it, it's restricted to the gardeners. You, we're not supposed to take uh, Cokes out of that machine. And he said, ah, oh, it's a dumb rule. Well, I was bothered by that. I didn't know whether it was a dumb rule or a good rule or a bad rule. It didn't seem to really be all that important one way or the other. The fact is it was a rule. He drank the Coke, and those things began to bother me. In the second year of college, I was still a close friend, but I didn't spend as much time with him because I'd made other friends as well, and I felt more and more uneasy about the way he acted and the things that he said and some of the things that he did. He began to talk a lot about a girl back in, uh, in the Midwest whom he had met a year before, and she wanted to come out to college. And I didn't like all of the innuendos he would make about her. There was a kind of a put-down of her, and yet at the same time he seemed to be interested in her. And I was a little bit bothered by his, his sort of macho uh, posturing and things that he would say that I felt a guy in the Church of God ought not say publicly or even privately about a young woman who's also a member of the Church of God. Our friendship began to cool even more. At the end of the second year, the girl arrived, and she had applied to college, and she moved into one of the dormitories. And uh, she began to break literally every rule in the book. Uh, she was infamous for a couple of years in the dormitories because if there was a rule, she found it, she focused in on it, and she broke it. And my friend began to break the rules with her. Now, he always arrived late to classes. He began to hang around with her continuously. And sometimes uh, she wouldn't sign out when she would leave the dormitory in the evening and sign in when she arrived back, which the girls had to do at the time. She wouldn't sign out. She didn't sign in. And she was viewed as a kind of a problem on the campus. Now, of course, I knew if you were an undergraduate, and they both were, that, you know, the rules of the college at the time prohibited any kind of a, quote, relationship, you know, quote, unquote, engagement, uh, marriage, uh, frequent dating and all that type of thing with the same person. And they were together all the time, and the rules said that could not occur. So uh, one day I talked to him. Our friendship wasn't as strong, but every now and then we would get together and talk and, 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 and uh, go out someplace for a hamburger or something of the kind. And again he looked at me and he said, you know, the rules are dumb. He said, if I want to go out with Betty, I'm going to go out with Betty. He said, she's my girl. In the third year, our friendship reached a kind of a low point, and especially when I began to give some sermonettes in some of the local congregations, and boy, that seemed to affect him somehow. He got very jealous and upset and uptight. I remember going out to Redlands to give the first sermonette I ever gave in my entire life. I don't necessarily remember much about the sermonette because it was not a good sermonette. It was a pretty, it was a pretty bad sermonette, and uh, a couple of you were there, and I... I wish you weren't, but, <laughs> you know, that was 22 years ago. But uh, I know Mrs. Bramble was there, and a few others were as well. Mrs. Richardson probably was there. She was uh, about, she was a young girl at the time, so she probably didn't pay any attention to what I said. I hope she didn't. <laughs> I'm pretty sure her mother did. Anyway, I, uh, I came back from that first sermonette. And I bumped into Bill in the hallway in, a, in the dormitory, and he sort of looked at me with a kind of a sneer on his face, and he said, Hey, it looks like you've been a good boy. He said, They put you on the good boy list. He met the sermonette list. That was a put-down. And from that day on, every time he saw me, he put me down. My best friend put me down. 
and he was trying to elevate himself, you see. I became the object of the put-downs, which hurt me because I, I, I felt close to him. I mean, we spent hours together in the first year of college. In the last year of college, I went to Brickett Wood. I went over to England, and he stayed in Pasadena. And he and uh, Betty got married. I didn't see him for a couple of years. He married the girl that I've told you about. Two years later, I came back to Pasadena, and I was a full-time ministerial assistant at the time. And uh, I tried to find Bill to see how he was doing, and I found out that he was a pencil pusher in the correspondence course department. I do mean a pencil pusher. Any any, any, any 12-year-old could have done what Bill was doing. He was sort of uh, making marks and holes when people would send in their correspondence course, and he would correct the lessons, you know, uh, by hand with a pencil, which is not exactly exciting. And I went in to see him, and, you know, he was sort of shattering, brother. And he was a guy with an...